All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and make sure you guys subscribe to this channel to make sure you keep getting more critical care content, such as this video here. Now, in this lesson here, we're going to be talking about a medication that I often find that a lot of people don't understand very well. Part of it may be the confusion that is often because of the look-alike, sound-alike relationship with dopamine, but it is a very different medication and used for different purposes, which we are going to discuss in this lesson here. So let's get into the lesson talking about dibutamine. So dibutamine is a commonly used medication, but it is also commonly misunderstood. It can play an important role in the treatment of our critically ill patients, thus it's important that you do understand how it works and why it is that we use it. So let's start off and talk about what is dibutamine and how does it work. So dibutamine, which also goes by the name Dobutrex, is classified as an inotropic agent. What this means is that it increases cardiac output. It has several different uses in those with heart failure and those in cardiogenic shock, as well as potential benefits in other low cardiac output states. Now, dibutamine is primarily a beta-1 agonist, which means that it activates beta-1 adrenergic receptors. So as a result of this activation, we're going to see increased contractility of the ventricle. This is ultimately going to lead to lower end systolic volume, which leads to an increase in our stroke volume. So if you remember our cardiac output equation, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, then you'll recognize that this increase in stroke volume is in turn going to increase cardiac output in our patients. Now one thing to keep in mind though is that beta blockers are going to work against the effects of dibutamine. Now dibutamine can also impact our patient's heart rate through this beta-1 activation, uh, although the effects of the elevation in heart rate is less pronounced than its inotropic effect. This increase in heart rate, though, can also contribute to the increase in cardiac output from the equation that we just talked about above. Now, in addition to the beta-1 activation, it does also have some beta-2 and alpha-1 effects. Alpha-1 leads to vasoconstriction, but the effect here is actually pretty minimal. Beta-2, which is more pronounced than our alpha-1 activation, primarily here is going to lead to vasodilation. Now this is not always seen and sometimes just negates the alpha-1 activation, but certainly can be seen in our patients and it is important to know about. So you want to be on the lookout for potential decreases in your patient's blood pressure initially. If your patient has low cardiac output though, we'll often see this negated by the increase in contractility and in fact we can see improvements in their blood pressure as a result of that increased cardiac output. Now, if this hypotension does present and persist in your patient, then at this point, you do want to stop the infusion and address their volume status. Now, this vasodilation can help to decrease filling pressure as well as our afterload, making it easier for the heart to contract, again, increasing stroke volume and thus our cardiac output. So that's the essence of how it is that dibutamine actually benefits our patient. Now I actually want to talk about some of the misconceptions or confusions between dibutamine and dopamine. Now, as I've mentioned, these two medications are often confused for one another, but they act in quite different ways. It also doesn't help that the dose ranges are very similar, uh, which I am going to discuss here in a minute. But if you remember about dopamine, which I did cover in a previous lesson, which I'm going to link to up above here, Dopamine is another beta-1 agonist, but it has more chronotropic effect, and thus we see more of an increased heart rate than we do contractility. Now, dopamine also has more alpha-1 activation, especially at the higher doses. So instead of vasodilation like we see with dibutamine, we're going to see vasoconstriction by increasing SVR and afterload with the use of dopamine. So I'm going to put up a quick chart here just to compare the effects of these two medications and hopefully help to drive this point home. So we're going to be taking a look at our cardiac output, our CVP, our pulmonary artery occlusive pressure, our SVR, our MAP, and our heart rate, and see how these two medications compare. So first we have our dibutamine, and here we're going to see a strong increase in cardiac output. We're actually going to see decreases in our CVP, PAOP, as well as our SVR, or our afterload. And then for our patient's blood pressure, our MAP, we're going to see increases here, and this is going to be primarily driven by the increased cardiac output. And then as far as their heart rate goes, it's either going to be about the same or we might see an increase. 
Now, when we talk about dopamine, we're going to talk about two different doses. We have our dose that's less than 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and then our dose that's going to be greater than 10. So for our lower dose, we are going to see that increase in cardiac output. We definitely are going to see increases in our CVP and our PAOP. And then as far as our afterload goes, it's either going to be about the same, or we might have at least initially some increase here. Uh, and the same is also going to go for our patient's MAP. But like I said, because of that chronotropic effect, we are definitely going to see an increase in heart rate. So now for our higher dose dopamine, once again, we're going to see that increase in cardiac output, that good increase in our CVP and our PAOP. But now because we're hitting those alpha-1 effects, we're going to see marked increase in our patient's SVR and their MAP. Uh, and then again, we're going to see the increased effects on our patient's heart rate. So hopefully kind of seeing these two side by side really shows you some of the big differences here. Really think about here dibutamine, the main benefit that we're getting is the increase in cardiac output as well as the support for our patient's blood pressure by increasing that cardiac output. Whereas dopamine, we're really looking at the increased heart rate and then at those higher doses, the increase in our patient's SVR and MAP as well. All right, so let's actually talk about some of the side effects that we can see. So some side effects that your patient could experience with dibutamine would be things like increased heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, it could lead to headache, nausea, vomiting, palpitations, ectopy, chest pain, and shortness of breath. Some potential adverse effects that we could see would be things like asthma attack. If they are in AFib, that this can lead to a rapid ventricular rate. Uh, we can also see ventricular ectopy, although actually seeing VTAC is rare in our patients. We can also potentially see hypotension, although again, this is pretty rare. And then finally, anaphylaxis. All right, so let's move on and talk about the dosing for dibutamine. So here we're going to give this as a continuous IV infusion. And the typical concentrations that we find are going to be seen in a mixture of D5 water. And those common premixed bags are going to be 250 milligrams and 250 mLs, which gives us one milligram per milliliter. And then we have 500 milligrams in 250 mLs, which gives us 2 milligrams per milliliter. And then we can also see 500 milligrams in 500 mLs, again, another 1 milligram per mL concentration. Now our dosing that we're going to give our patients is going to be in micrograms per kilogram per minute, which is the same that we use for dopamine. So again, this is going to add to that confusion. But our typical dose for this medication is going to range from 2 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute. That said, we can go up to 40 mics per kilogram, but it's not often that we're going to be using it at this high dose. Now we're going to see this medication take effect as early as 2 minutes, but it can take up to 10 minutes for its peak effect. So we typically aren't titrating this medication, but when we do, we want to make sure that we're giving it at least 5 to 10 minutes between the titrations so that we can see those effects. Alright, so let's talk about our use of this medication in critical care. And there's really three primary uses that are only going to be seen in critical care. The first of these is going to be cardiogenic shock. And this is actually one of our main uses for this medication. And the whole purpose here is that by increasing the stroke volume, and as well as potentially our patient's heart rate, while also reducing the afterload, that we're going to help to increase our patient's cardiac output, which is going to preserve systemic blood flow. This is obviously a problem in cardiogenic shock and definitely is going to be benefit for these patients. Now, another potential use that we have in the ICU is going to be as a bridge to support for patients with late-stage heart failure. And so here we're using dibutamine for its inotropic support, and again for patients with that late-stage heart failure who really haven't responded to other directed therapies. By using dibutamine here, that this can help to bridge them to a longer-term solution such as mechanical circulatory support such as AVAD or even heart transplant. That said, we can also use this medication long term for palliative support for those patients who really aren't going to be candidates for either of the above. And then finally, the last potential use in the ICU is going to be in our patients with sepsis. Now there is support for its use and there are recommendations that do come from the surviving sepsis campaign in the use of dibutamine in patients who uh, have sepsis and also have systolic dysfunction. And our goal here is preserving end organ functioning. Decreases in mortality were seen in patients when dibutamine was given when our patient's SCVO2 was less than 70%.
So those are our potential uses for dibutamine, uh, what we often will find in the ICU, as well as an overall review of this medication. Again, lots of confusion that comes up around this medication. It's oftentimes confused with dopamine. Uh, so hopefully this lesson helped to kind of clarify some of the differences between those two medications and why we actually would be using dibutamine. So I really hope that you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please leave me a like down below. It really goes a long way to help support this channel in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm, as well as leave me some comments. Let me know what you thought of this lesson. I love to read your comments and I try to respond to just about everybody. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do so, as well as share this lesson with anybody else that you think might find it useful. A special shout out to our awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys provide for this channel is truly appreciated. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson in this series. Otherwise, check out a couple really awesome lessons that I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.